Okay. Let's learn. Okay, let's learn. Let's learn. Yeah, let's learn. Thank you, Anna. Um, let's just everything. It's confusing. So I think already we can see that we failed <laughs> in the um, in the uh, in in the way that we that we worked so hard to figure this thing out after last week. And uh, I think this is still like a problem because we're like facing this thing on camera where essentially what we wanted to do was actually to be back in the room with everybody. And I can already see that it's not as easy because we can, this thing is getting in the way. But uh, hi, everybody here. It's a work in progress. It really for sure. is a work in, in frustration. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom, everybody. Shabbat shalom. Great to have practically a full room in front of us. Wow. And a full screen. Exactly. <laughs> So we'd like to jump in. We're going to be learning. Uh, we have a lot to learn today and, and a lot to, to listen to from the tradition. And uh, we're going to start with uh, the Torah. And then we're going to um, make our way into some of these sources that have to do with uh, what we, we've labeled uh, a children's holiness code. I kind of alluded to this last night in, the, in my sermon about uh, the absolute uh, vacuum of literature that seems to have been in uh, uh, around the holiness code uh, for the way that we might treat our children. And given that Shabbat of the child, we're going to be looking at some sources that might reconstruct or construct um, uh, a holiness code, um, kind of sources that might give uh, direction on how to, how to be with kids and how to treat our children. And uh, so anybody in this room would like to uh, uh, begin with the Berchot Torah? Anybody? Margo? Bakasha? Amen. 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 Okay. Um, so uh, let's begin. Let's begin. Let's here start. We go. Okay, here we go. So a quick comment to begin with, I was just talking to, to James about this that Leviticus is the centerpiece book in the five books and Kedoshim, holiness, is the centerpiece in the book of Leviticus. So at the heart of the Torah is this injunction of Kedoshim to you, you shall be holy. So I think it's really profound and interesting in itself, just to give it a larger frame. Yeah, it's, it's interesting just to, um, To, to understand that as the, as the core piece and then to un, then understand um, you know the in, in a sense the, the Torah begins with the kedusha not in person I mean the word isn't really used vis-a-vis -vis humans the word kedusha is used uh, for for the first time vis-a-vis -vis time which Heschel made a big you know uh, name for himself around that issue um, big simus. Uh, yeah, it's a big simus, exactly. <laughs> so that we're people of time and time and time and so on, which is certainly true from the rabbinic perspective. He wanted to say from the biblical perspective, but by the time we arrive at the centerpiece of the Torah, it's very clear that there's a kedusha that uh, for in person in nefesh that is vital. And a kedusha of practice. And a kedusha of, of, of practice. Action. And you know, we just heard it in the, in the bracha. The blessing, right? Every time we say a blessing, share Kiddushana. Share Kiddushana. You, you have made us holy. So what does that mean? Right. Right. So we're going to look at this. I think to some degree that, like last night when I, when I spoke about Kiddusha last night, and this is obvious for, I think, for all of us who studied this at all, that there's Kiddusha that already exists and Kiddusha that has to be constructed or, or uh, there have to be that that have to have the right conditions for them to emerge like kedusha that's potential and kedusha that's already actualized right and so um in some sense kedoshim to you is 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 both of those in some sense kedoshim as kedushana we've already been sanctified but then of course the action that we enact is also part of our ongoing sanctification of the world and ourselves so so let's look at the uh, let's look at some of these sukim, some of these verses and uh, maybe you'll have some some folks in the room uh, and then also, we'll also in the Zoom, engage us with these texts. So, Lakasha. So, we're starting from uh, the beginning of the Parsha, the beginning of uh, Kedoshim. 
um, with the injunction of you shall be holy. And, you know, again, just to say, I think it's worth saying one more time, that there's so much in the holiness code about adults and about parents, but not about children. So we're looking to these sources to see how we might construct, with what principles we might construct a holiness code regarding how adults treat children. So, and God spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the whole Israeli community. I think the, the whole is, is also instructive there. It's not just Adat ben B'nai Israel. It's not just the Israelite community. The uh, Amarta Elehem Kiddoshim to you and say to them, you shall be holy. So it sounds to my ears like an injunction, right? Not that you aren't essentially holy, but you shall be holy. Why? Ki Kadosh Ani Because I, your God, am holy. So what does God's holiness have to do with our holiness? And um, how do we become holy? So those, those are the two questions presented by the first verse here. Absolutely. And the word to you here is really complicated. It's really uh, the word to you can be a promise. It can be a commandment. It can be, you know, you know be holy. No, yeah. no, be holy. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> right, 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 right. Right, no, right. everybody act, be holy. Act as you are essentially or act in such a way so that you are holy, you become holy. Right. Right. Or, or, or even like, yeah, right. I, you know, I, I said this in my in a message that I gave to, sent to the community in the video that the Shia Leibowitz, the great philosopher, the brother, scientist, brother of uh, Nechama Leibowitz, her, his more famous, deservedly so, <laughs> sister, who was a great Parshani, uh, maybe the greatest of our generation, of Torah, Kamtir and Torah, Shia Leibowitz was really bo bothered by a number of things, essentially, in his, in his oeuvre of, li of philosophical literature. One of the things that bothered him the most was the notion of intrinsic holiness uh, because he felt that it led to idolatry mm. so he was and complacency and complacency right right and so like mislabeled holiness or misunderstood holiness was a really big one of his th like themes he was famously very very uh you know um when it came he was very very cynical about and very and felt it was very dangerous the way that people treated the holiness of Kotel. of the kotel right. the kotel was like the, the wailing wall the wailing wall or any piece of like property, like like anything in the world, to say this is holy, we thought could lead very, and he's not wrong, could lead to the kind of absolutizing of something that is relative or something that is like, it's just, you know, it's stones. They don't have holiness in the way that you imagine them to be, or the land, for example, which is also interesting when you have conversations within a community like ours where God's imminent presence in matter is an assumption of our theology, right? It's like, 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 Leibowitz had a real hard time with that. It's so like, you know, like be careful about making stones and, and property and land into holiness um, in the way that you imagine. And he had a big hard time with this one, too. He said, like, it doesn't mean that you're already holy. Like a Jew is not, you know, invited to think that they're already a finished product. They have to see themselves as continually growing towards holiness. Um, and he felt it was very dangerous, right, to think, oh, I'm holy. Because, you know, of course, of course, you know, it's extreme because as you'll see in the next source, there is, of course, there are sources that say that we are, of course, holy. I mean, that we talked about last night, already holy. But in the sources from source number two in, in the Parsha Korach, you can hear in, in, the, in the claim of Korach something about the inherent or intrinsic holiness of every person that already is, as it were. So this is amazing because you brought in Yishayu, Yishayahu Leibovich, and I was studying this morning with my favorite to Sharon, and I didn't have time to put the Leibovich page, but you just cited it. Like that's exactly where we're studying. But the reason I put the Karach on the page because of Leibovich's comment. Right. And it brings to mind the concept for me of that. your play. I saw that, when you, meaning I understood. What, you understood, what you understood, we understand each other. You know, <laughs> we often say children are precious. That can go in two directions. Oh, they're, they're so precious. Or they're right. precious. Like how do you, we should treat our children like they're precious, but do they become too precious in our sort of tending of them and protecting them. Right. So last night, I know that you didn't hear my sermon because I know that you said that Facebook was cutting in and out, but the notion of out of this world, like children are out of this world, right? They're you know, like, you know, you say to someone out of this world as a phrase means that you're beyond this world or it's like this world can't contain the accolade that I'm giving you. Oh, it's out of this world, that cake or that morning sunshine muffin. It's out of this world, out of this world. But out of this world also, right, is a, um, 
means that they emerge from the world, which is what I talked about last night, the emergence from the world itself, um, which speaks to the kind of the, the, the ambivalence of that phrase or the, the multivalence nature of it is exactly this, like are children precious? Is their preciousness something that, that is uh, inherent? Yes. Is it something also that is emergent? Yes. And so which is it? Is it something that needs to be cultivated or honored? And both of those are true. And how do we hold them? So, so let's look at this source number two from Korach, um, uh, which, which you brought. So why don't you... Korach, son of Yitzhar, son of Kohad, son of Levi, he took himself. Uh, strange translation, but it's not clear in the Hebrew what Korach actually took. Korach seems to take nothing at all. Along with Datana, Abiran, son, sons of Eliav, and On, son of Pelet, descendants of Reuben. So they all gather together. Why? To rise up against Moses, together with 250 Israelite chieftains of the community, chosen the, uh, in the assembly, men of repute, so people of or men of status. They combined against Moshe and Aaron and said to them, you have gone too far, too, you've taken too much for all the community are holy, all of them, and Adonai is in their midst. Why then do you, do you raise yourself above God's congregation? So here's the idea of intrinsic holy. They're already holy, so there shouldn't be no status. Like Moshe and Aaron shouldn't have more power or more authority than the community because everyone's the same amount of holiness and naturally they don't have to do anything to become holy. So inherent holiness or you know, and and the rebellion here, as it were, is that that somehow again, without getting into Korach per se, because Korach is like a whole parsha literally, and it's a whole parsha figuratively, but it's, but the claim of, of like the denial of a basic, of a basic uh, kiddushah, right, and, and the, like, that Korach's claim is very much rooted in, um, you know, kikolai da kulam kiddushim uvetokham adonai. Now, like, without getting into that, like, that's clearly, I, you know, on Shabbat of the Chal, we might argue and say very clearly that for, for a couple thousand years, children have not had a Korach to stand up and say, you know yeah, what? Might need Korach yeah, weekend. it's like, you know, we're, right. we're, you know, to mom right. and dad and say like, hey, you, you know, Moshe, you know, the mini Moshe, dad's the mini Moshe of the community, and mom's the, you know, the mini Moshe, le, and whatever it is, Miriam, and say, Lou, like, hey, look at us. Like, who are you, parents? Who made, you the, who who made you the boss of me? You're not, you're not, you're the, not boss the boss of, of me. me. You're not the boss of me. <laughs> right? You're not the boss of me. Now, like, it, it's clear the connection between Kedushah and power is really, is really underscored here, yes, right? Exactly. The, the, the underscoring here in thematically of, 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 of like, the Korach's claim of why you know who set you above us is is rooted in a claim of kedusha. I could have said it differently. Could have said like, why do you who, you know nobody appointed you? Let's have democracy. Like you know nobody's appointing me. Let's, right, uh, let's have an election. But, right. Clearly, clearly, <laughs> right. there's a connection between um, the inherent holiness and and the claim of uh, of authority and compliance and direction. That's really part of pedagogy and part of like family systems and societies and culture and so on. So. It's a very powerful piece, um, and with it, um, we move from there into um, like a basic principle, I think, of kedusha. So kedusha, as we've just seen, can be understood as a you know, on some level, we haven't said exactly what it is precisely. We haven't defined it, but All we know is God is is holy. Right, and we we know, should become holy because God is holy. Right. Something about we should participate in God's right, essence. Right. Right. Something about this that the Torah begins this week with a, with a holiness code that is predicated on a holiness that we share or that we are to emulate or we are to go into a shikirishanu, right? Some version of that, and and then we've also seen that that there is an inherent holiness with tocham that in them is the divine, this, and 
that also is part of the definition of Kiddusha. And uh, we move backwards slightly to say that even if we don't know what it is, we do know that, and every year we talk about this, that there is a Shmirah, that somehow wherever you find Kiddusha, you also find Shmirah. Wherever you have Kiddusha, you find the word Shmirah, or which means to observe or to protect it. Speaking of preciousness, or something which is precious, right? So if you look at source number three, right, that one could argue that the first holy space, although it's not named as such, but it become, what becomes the precursor to all later holy space is the holiness of the Garden Eden, of Garden Eden. So in verse uh, 15 in chapter two, like Adunai Elohim et Adam, and God takes the man, the humanity, Vayani Chebegan Eden, and places that one in the Garden of Eden. And to do what? Le'ovda, to work it, to serve in it. Ule Shomra, and to guard over, protect it. So it's not exclusive, of course, to the Garden of Eden and holiness in space, but that's a clear function of, like, we have to, it's more, we have to watch over it. And it's the same thing is true in time. Of course, the first time that Kiddusha is used, it's vis-a-vis Shabbat. And then later on in the book of Exodus, it says, Rasham Rubenes of the Shabbat. They observe it, but of course, it could also mean that they protect it, that they watch over it, Shmirah. We have to watch over sacred time in some sense, right? Because it's a special thing. It's a special sign between us and the divine. And six days, God has, right? God has created the world. And on the seventh day, Shabbat Vayinafash. So Shmirah shows up there also in time. And then finally, in person, <clears throat> I'm sorry, in verse five is also about Shmirah vis time. And then source six in the third access that is classically understood in, in Torah, holiness and space, and in time and now in person, we are enjoined in, in, in uh, source number six in Deuteronomy 415, have a lot of Shmirah for your soul. Protect your soul, right? Because all that you have, as Tracy Chapman told us, is your soul. Kilari Isim Kotumanai goes on to say, right, in this particular one, make sure that you don't defy your souls by imagining that there is a Tumna, a picture of God, as it were, right? It was something more ephemeral. But without getting into the content of that verse, the, the function of Shmirah, so of course, Ushmartim Da Mitzvot, and there's a lot of Shmirah when it comes to people and their souls. So each, there's a protection that is guaranteed or Enjoying to all of us, enjoying, enjoying not right? Not guaranteed, exactly. Thank you. But this means that kedusha can be eroded. In other words, the right, the nafka. I mean, the assumption, the presumption here is, if we don't lishmor, if we don't guard kedusha holiness, we won't have holiness. Right. Because it's there, but human beings perhaps or we might them. have holiness, inherent holiness, but we won't be fulfilling the obligation of like. We might defile the inherent holiness, and we also might not right. build the... Right, it the, might be inherent, but right. it can be eroded. It can easily, be eroded. Trampled. Upon. Right, right. Not right. completely Just like destroyed. Children can be sh- trampled upon. Totally. Right. Right, so there's, a, there's an aspect of Le'ovda ul Shomra, I would want to say, in all of these levels. In other words, there's a corrosion that comes from, at, from not watching over, right. and there's also a missed opportunity to develop yeah. the not yet holy like to tend to it. To tend to it and to, yeah. right, to, to cultivate it and to, right. We'll see that a little bit more. Um, now, we move into, yeah, Wendy. Um, in terms of, of holiness, um, is it, would you say it's finite? Or infinite? Like, is there a point where you maximize the holiness? Or can the holiness expand infinitely indefinitely Indefinitely. so i guess wendy's asking uh, wendy is asking us a question um on the like if the holy is both intrinsic and inherent or like in hearing in particular like it's there to be discovered and also that which as i said last night expands into the not yet holy um does that have a limit does that like is there a place where we're like okay ad khan up until here there's no no more left to hold it to holy eyes or uh, to, to realize, right? I would say the Torah recognizes our limited capacity to live in holiness. So there are some designations of realms of holiness, which can be expanded and are infinite, but we can't, we can't always access that. That's what I would say. I, I would say it's aspirational. I would agree with that. I would say yeah. that, that it's aspirational, that, that when the Torah, and let's put it this way, 
I don't want to speak for the Torah, I speak for the rabbis, understanding of the Torah and the way that the rabbis construct a world of Jewish life in the way that they use the Torah to construct that life. In rabbinic construction of holiness, there's certainly limits, but there's also a, a dream, a vision of a world that is like what used, you know, Tyre de Chardin, the great uh, Catholic theologian, um, wrote about the divinization of the world. He imagined the biosphere, the newosphere, and then the, like the, at some point it would be the, the complete divinization of the world. And, and in that, in Christological thinking, that's called the resurrection of Christ, right? Like that we, there's full incarnation of the world, as it were. And we might say that in the Olam Abba, the world to come will be, you know, Kulo Shabbat. The Olam Abba Shabbat. is always right. coming it's always towards coming. us. Right. But then the Zohar struggles to say that Olam Abba is already here. It's, yeah. it's, it's a perception, right? Yeah. So, like, you know, like, so I think that in, the more you tend to see, the more the theology of Judaism moves towards immanentism, where God is all things and in all things, the more that theology right, grips a particular community or a particular thinker, the more the possibility and the frustration of the not yet holy being realized becomes, you know, comes to the fore. It's like, we're not yet there. And then they'll say, oh, but we are. Don't you realize it's just, you have to see it. And, and the Zohar is like, it's there already. See it, open up in your eyes, you'll see it. But, but like Yishai Leibowitz and others will be like, no. <laughs> We're not, there's, no, we're not there yet, and we might never get there, because that's just, there's no there to get to. There will always be. Although I keep coming know. back to the bracha, and to the um, system of medvot, which constantly sanctify. You know, so it is, it's here, but it's not here. Like, we're constantly bringing it down. Right. It's like a very radical system, actually. It is, but, you know, they're, they're, again... Like, just mainstream rabbinic Judaism is, yeah. like, very radical to me. Like, 100 blessings a day of participating in God's reality and making, like, olam haba manifest at this moment. Right, and it's, it's, it's very radical. And it's not nearly as radical as the notion that any assumption that, that we're not there further perpetuates the binary between now and then. And so, so it's, it's super radical because our lived consciousness is mostly in the not yet holy. And so the rabbis do what normal mysticism, Max Kedushin called it normal mysticism. It's like, if you're in the middle of your day, you're, you're drinking a cup of coffee and all of a sudden you're like, oh! Oh, God made this cup of coffee. Right. Look at this. So, so we got to get back to the children. Margot, if, you, if people can hold, is it something? I, I know, but we, we have 30 pages of stuff. So we got, we have, so let's go into like the, when your child tell, asked you, tell them about, right? So let's talk about the inherent holiness of children in source number seven. So children are created in the image of God. You want to? Yeah, I don't think we have to read this whole source, just that. You know, the, the radical um, concept that the Torah begins with in verse 27. So God created humankind in the divine image, creating it in the image of God, creating them male and female. So I like the plural. I like the singular. Okay. Um, you know, and it's obviously it doesn't only it referred to adults it refers to children and just remembering that but not obviously it's obvious now because this is in yeah. our in our code of, of holiness yeah. because it, you know of course children were not considered necessarily to have this their kind of dignity or their own holiness matured. until they matured right, right. or that right. kind of thing right so so we have already two principles in our holiness code one is that all holiness requires protection so that would demand that children who are holy because of the second source here, children already are holy. They also re re require shnira, yes. right? Protection and cultivation and so on. That's a kind of a correlate of being created in the image of God and having intrinsic holiness like any other human being. They also require shmira. Now that's the second principle. The third principle will be curiosity and the, the cultivation of children's inner life through the setting up a, an arena where children's questions are both welcomed and honored and vital participants in religious life and in adult life. Like the notion that the most important ritual of Jewish life, which is arguably the Passover Seder, is constructed as a dialogue between a father and a son or between a parent and a child, is itself the underpinning of the holiness code principle, which is 
children need to participate in, and we need to be shaped by the questions that our children ask us. And the intergenerational relationship is based on the question and the child's question and guided by that question. And I would say, finally, the, the answer is all about freedom. So what we're essentially teaching our children when they ask, when they ask four times in the Torah, is about freedom. So it's got to have implications for their freedom or their release or our non-ownership of them. It's beautiful. Let's just, so look at the source with that source number eight, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This is one place where the, the Haggadah is, is, of course, grounded in this. This is where the rabbis, uh, this is the seed from which the rabbis build the, the, the garden, the beautiful floral arrangement that is the Haggadah. This is, of course, the question of the, of the quote-unquote chacham, right? But really, there's no such definitional, right? In the Torah, it's just your children, when they ask you, what are these things, right? Then you have to respond to them and give them an answer, right? Give them an answer. Um, the next principle, of course, is the notion that Shabbat is um, a time of release, which means an ethic of special time with our children. An ethic of, of that there's a, yeah, go ahead. No, and in Dvarim, in Deuteronomy, both the son and the daughter are named, right? So it's the release is not only for you, who's the you, perhaps the, the male Israelite is being addressed, perhaps the male and female, it's not clear, but it's you, your, you know, your, your son, your daughter, your slaves, your animals, like the release is complete. So I think it's another practice of non-ownership of our children. Grounded in Yitzhiyat Mitzrayim, grounded in liberation from Egypt. So when, when, if one, if, if you notice in, in source number 10, which we brought from, um, from the Declaration of the Rights of the Child, um, which comes from the, from a website dealing with, with Israel's Declaration of the Rights of the Child, also in, how, in, in Israel's pedagogy, um, we have this, the phrase which we didn't, which is based upon the international establishment of the, of the Declaration of the Rights of the Child, but this one is basically, um, this is the introduction to the notion that children had rights, right, which is a radical idea. It's a radical idea even within Jewish right, literature that children have rights. Um, and it, it is, you know, that source actually, we should have put it as the first source because that actually is the impetus yes. for the entire, what we call, they call the Declaration of Rights, we would call it the, the Holiness Code, right? The obligations that we have towards our children and the obligation we have to, to, to treat our children in a particular way. Um, we have um, source number 11 here really beautiful that it's possible to learn obligations to care for our young from the animal world the great gemara the great talmudic uh, piece um should we read it go ahead amar rabbi ila amar reish lakish mishra rabbi yehuda bar chanina be'usha itkinu she adam zanet banav ve'bnotav kishen ktanim like in apparently in uh, in in Usha, they they had established that one should sustain their children when they're tiny when they're minors. But a dilemma was raised by to the rabbis, right? Is that really the halacha? Must a person feed their children in practice or not? <laughs> Which is an amazing question, right? Like really, is that the question? So. Um, so the rabbis asked this question, and they say, Tashma, come in here, come and learn. If you have also the coming of Yehuda Marlu, Yarud Yalda, the Abne Masa, it says, um, when we come before Rabbi Yehuda to complain about a father who refused to sustain his children, he would say to them, Yaro, the jackal bears offspring and casts the obligation to feed them on the residents of the town. Even an animal, even a jackal feeds its young, and it's certainly proper for a father to support their children. Right? And that's a pretty amazing thing. The Gemara now is look, learning like what basic parenting should look like from a jackal. It's like you're not even acting the way a, a, like an animal would act. You're, you're abandoning your child. Like even animals don't do that, right? There's a certain nature that is inherent yeah. in, in, right? They're appealing to, to, to the nature of the animal world. 
Right, which we're part of. Right, be, be at least be as good as an animal. Yeah, yeah. Be, just be right. as good as an animal. Right. It's not a high level. Yeah. Like a jackal. Right, but it's interesting, they're not turning to Torah for a proof text. They're turning to animal behavior as a proof text. Which is, okay. And then, uh, once again, similar question, right? And they learn it from a raven. That's the end of the, like the end of the, like they keep going to the animal world and the, the animal world, it becomes the source of, of this basic obligation, which is to care for their children. Now, there's another example of, um, of one of the places which we talked about last night, where the Torah is not going to be explicit about every single situation. Right? We would have expected the Torah to at least be explicit about some of these obligations, but it's not. Right. We would have hoped. Right. And so the rabbis resort. They list very few and very specific ones. Right. So let's stop here for a second. I think that there are some questions in the, in the room and also in the Zoom. And uh, we'll come back. We have a couple more sources that we'd like to share with all of you around this theme. I know that I saw James had his hand up. And James, did you want to ask a question or make a comment? I thought I saw well, Amy. You know, I was going to say that um, I look at uh, perhaps at God Aiden, in terms of the question of children and holiness, that God Aiden is sometimes seen as a parable for childhood, that Adam and Eve are children, and therefore they are, this God Aiden is this place that is almost intrinsically holy, and there's a, there's a lack of holiness literature relating to children because they are intrinsically holy, and a big part of people are shim or parsha are laws relating to sexual holiness. And children may be in that more innocent state, Floyd notwithstanding, of you know, pre-sexuality, let's say. And in our lives, part of the holiness that rabbis refer to as first relates to sexuality. And, and so children, we don't need to talk about children in holiness because they carry that spirit in a way that we're trying to get to. So that's, I guess that's the argument from omission is to then imagine, I mean, imagine that it's so obvious that again, it doesn't need to be stated, like that there's a certain, right. But what we know from our world is that we need to be rock of children. Like, right, you're guard, but you're guarding what's already there. Right. Saying, as opposed to trying to imbue it, they for us to teach homeless, we can only approach all Yes, and they certainly have that intrinsically, but it's it's really if we look at the at the Torah itself and ask ourselves, is the way that the Torah speaks to speaks about or doesn't speak about pedagogy, um, is that right? Will will that lead to a world where children are are safe? Like if you look back and actually check it out, were children treated you know in a safe way? And it also begs the question, like Shabbat is also holy, but the Torah doesn't go out of its way to, to say, like, you'll, you know, we have to make sure that we honor Shabbat. Well, it's giving the Torah, James is giving the Torah the benefit of the doubt. Yes. And then you can go in either direction. You could say the Torah is blind to the holiness of children, or the holiness of children is so blinding, they didn't have to, they didn't have to mention it. Right. I certainly think that um, the, the prohibition against child sacrifice in the Torah and notwithstanding the Akedah, it's certainly um, certain right sexual mores that we're protecting to some degree directing, but on the one hand, but you know, whatever, there are a lot of instances that are very difficult from the place of standpoint of children, you know, in the Torah itself, and it's hard to imagine a Bronze Age text being as as uh, progressive as we would like it to be, um, and so we kind of let it off the hook in that way too. Um, in much the same way, we let it off the hook for kind of the things it didn't do around slavery and and obviously with women and right. Yeah, so certainly it, I think that um, what we're seeing, what we're advocating for, especially now, if we look, move from, from the Torah and the rabbinic literature to, to our current Jewish realities, right, there's certainly an insufficient level of explicit shmirah for children in our institutions. There's certainly an insufficient level of shmirah around pedagogy um, until this last century. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis children and and even some of the literature that we didn't bring around corporal punishment for children in pedagogical contexts, um, 
You know, we saw some, you know, not Rabbi, you know, Rav Natrunai Gaon, when an early ninth century, uh, you know, Babylonian teacher wrote a wrote a response to saying, you know, you know, in schools where they hit children, um, you know, the practice is really not a good idea, right? you know, <laughs> and uh, and so it's clear that certain levels of pedagogy and and uh, and actually violence towards children was countenanced as part of the general understanding of, ch of children as um as as property uh to some degree and judaism was forward thinking in many ways and in many ways not so thanks thanks for that point um i'm gonna take we haven't had somebody from the zoom guy yet so um uh amy you had your hand up okay um i'm i looked at Ankles and uh he had a very long article but i will gel it down and may be concise uh, Nachmanides says, embrace holiness. Embracing holiness transcends the laws of practice and, in, and in, uh, encourages moderation in all matters, even in permitted behavior, behavior like drinking is permitted, but drunkenness isn't. Eating is behavior, good, okay, but gluttony is not. Maimonides developed, uh, says to develop habits according to the golden mean. Sephorno tells us to emulate the ways of God because God created man in his image. Midrash Leviticus Rabbah tells us many of the essential laws in this chapter will lead us to holiness and also the following of the Ten Commandments. Sephira tell us, tells us just as God is set apart, so must you be set apart because the word holiness equals separation. And my addition is holiness is contagious and the Jewish gift to humanity is making time holy and sacred, as in Shabbat. Thank yes, you. thank you, Amy. There's a there's a there's a lot about the kedusha that uh, about the topic of kedusha, especially that Ramban, which I spoke about at length last night, where he says that one is permitted. The kedusha here has nothing to do with your the regular things that we've been commanded to avoid, but to uh, to not be a naval, be a Torah, not to be a glutton, which means to understand that even if something is permissible, it's not it's not part of how you build a holy life, and that not everything in our daily activities can be legislated by the Torah. But there's a certain understanding the Torah assumes that we have, um, which is which is itself a good question. Like, how, is that really true? Do we, you know? Um, but we'll take uh, we're gonna take any. It, was there Margaret? Did you want somebody else said something, or we're we're gonna move on? And then David, yeah. Um, also, in in the uh, Buddhist stories, we have to have to have to have to have to have I think love is the key to seeing the tzelem. And when a child is born, we're gifted with this surge of love most of the time, unless there's you know, postpartum depression. It is this gift from God that just makes the love pour. I kind of agree with James that the, the holiness is, is just so blazing out of them. And they have, they have this potential that we should nurture. We're commanded to convey the but not to not to love them. Um, why not? You know, why isn't the command to love the children? Because I think it's a gift. Mm. And with love, we can see the salam mm. in, in everybody, in, in our neighbors and, and children. Love is good. Beautiful, beautiful, Margo. I was I was remembering yesterday with um, Rabbi Inger that Wordsworth said that a newborn trails clouds of glory, mm -hmm. right? So that that essential holiness, at least in the beginning, is just you know overpowering. Overwhelming. And then when you get mad at your kid later on, <laughs> it's not not so overwhelming. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to it's keep like, that. Get out of my face. <laughs> well, it's interesting. Shivit Yashem and Tamid. We have the commandment to bring to give, you know, you know, place God before us at all times, but maybe it should also be place the love of your child before you as often as possible. Remember that. I mean, mm. it's interesting to maybe have to often have a synoptic chart between the child as they are now and the child as they once were. Right? Maybe in our before our mind's eye, if we were to able to see that essential holiness in, in the essential holiness really in every human being like yeah. like one of the cover note that i often have shared that i that i think about with people is that i when i look at them i i i regress in my mind as i look at them and i see them as an infant 
And it's mm. and I try to hold that image often that. in my mind um, because it's very much a reminder of their of their intrinsic uh, holiness, even if their this their unskillful behavior and mind states are leading them to do things that are completely uh, uh, unskillful and hurtful. Right. So beautiful. And, and they don't they don't cancel yeah. each other out. Right. Yeah. And it's not as though right. because they were once an infant doesn't mean that now we permit them to be harmful to us to someone else. But it can actually make, it can keep our our soul moist. I know people. It can also guide our behavior. You know, I remember when I first had children, I started to look at homeless people on the street differently because I remembered or I understood that each one of them was loved at some point by parents. Or not. Or or not. Or not. Right, but that you know, right, but each that, one was a child in some way, right. and that heartbreaking fact, right, made seeing them and the lack of dignity on the street even more painful. Even more painful. Um, uh, David Siegman, go ahead, and then we're going to go back to, to our, our source text. Um, Jabez, I wanted to just bring up this the phrase in the Torah is Ki Yishalcha Binka, when, when the child asks, that seems so essential to being a child. And it, it raises the question of spiritual questioning and spiritual doubt. Mm -hmm. uh, do we guard, do we bring Shmira? to the holiness of doubt and questioning when a child comes to us with spiritual questions. What is God? Where is God? Or do we say, uh, you know, here's the answer. I've got the answer for you, just to essentially quiet them down. Yeah, the, the, the attitude we have towards a child's curiosity, especially as it relates to the potential undermining of something that we hold very near and dear to ourselves really puts us in a in the in the in the intensity of um of uh i guess the what, what's the uh, the crucible of our own faith and trust in our own process and the process of the child's own like there's no way to force a child to where there is a way to compose, there actually there is a way to force, but that, that it ultimately doesn't work and coercion won't work when it comes to belief. And do we shut things down because we're uncomfortable? We don't want to be stable, de be destabilized, destabilized right. from our own belief systems. Right. And so little, you know, especially little fiefdoms that we have as parents. So so let's look at this source number 16 as it, it in Hebrew, I'm going to read it to you, but then we're going to go to source 20. So we're going to go from 16 to 20. And this is from the same uh, document that was dealing with the rights of the child. And in it, there was a situation where the where um, a teacher was using was pulling children by their ears, right? Like you know, like pulling the child by the ear, and it came before the court. And um, and so here's the, I'm going to read. I'm going to translate the, the Hebrew because there's a phrase in here that that uh, in that is bolded and then translated in English. That's really quite profound. The behavior of the of this teacher or the, or the one here who has been brought before us is very it's, it's very um, uh, extreme. It's it's uh, it's it's uh, strident. It's wrong. He has injured in a horrible in a horrible way, harmed the body and the soul of the student. The small student who has been given over to her responsibility or educational responsibility. Physical violence against a student is prohibited. Malkot, striking, makot oznaim, hitting or, or whipping or pulling an ear. That there's no place for that in a school. It, the, the, the school, the classroom, is a place for teaching and for, for guidance. Velo zirat alimut. It's not a place for, for violence. And then this phrase, gufo shel talmid v'nafshoh, the body of a student and their soul, enam hefker, are not hefker. They are not ownerless. Tvodo ki adam, their dignity as a human nifga is injured, is wounded. In morav mafilim klapav alimut fizit. If their teachers are, are are engaging with them in a physically violent way. This is that their bodies are not hefkir. Your soul is not hefkir. Is like anybody can come and take somebody that's hefkir. It's like it's like you know it's it's free reign. Just you know hefkir. I'm Do leaving you free. Do what you want. Do what you want. Right. 
Like it's up, it's up to you. Right. Right. And she's and and this this statement that the body of a student and their soul is not healthcare. It's not system. available for you to do what you want to the, to them. Yeah. Right. Which I think is really profound, and it seems to me the opposite of shmila. Like hefker means you, the opposite. you abdicate, and shmira means you tend to honor and respect. And not just that, it's amazing in Jewish law, the word shmira, shomer, becomes the, the designation of someone who watches over something like an agent. Like, I've right. given this over to right. you, you're a shomer. Right, a pick like, don't, right? It's a pick up, like, yeah. God says, here's, here's the, that child belongs to me, God says, right, as it were. Like, meaning, like, that spirit saying, this child is, has its own inherent intrinsic dignity, and you are the guardian, like in the in Khalil Gibran's, your children are not your children. They are the sons and the daughters of life's longing for itself. They come through you, but they are not yours. And so often, even to this day, legal literature in America assumes, and it as you know, as such, that there is a cultural distinction that can be made between each and every family unit, and there are no objective standards for parenting. So that so the parent can come before the court. We talked about this last night with with Inbal Cohen, Doctor Inbal Cohen, who said, who's a who's a, an expert in the field of, of child malpractice. And we talked about uh, a situation years ago um, where a famous football player named Adrian Peterson, who was the Minnesota Vikings at the time, running back for the Minnesota Vikings, a very famous, well paid, very well you know like a, a revered uh, athlete in the world of the biggest sport in America, which is football. And and of course, it's it's also the property, of course, of the Minnesota Vikings and of the NFL makes millions of dollars for the owners and so on. This person was on the front page of the New York Times for having switched his four his, uh, four year old child. Switching means to take a branch off a tree and to and to whip them. Malcolm. Malcolm. Right. Exactly, just right. like this. Right. And it was suspended for a few games, and then it was you know given re remediation or something like that. And it and it raised a huge question. Of, around cultural practices vis-a-vis -vis parenting. Like in the African-American community, there is, you know, and in other communities, there are um, assumptions about how you rear, and that's the term used, a child, right? And you don't tell me as a parent how to, this is my child, we even use the language of mine. This is my child, and I will do with my child as I, I see fit, given, you know, to, 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 to raise the child. And this, of course, raises the question, this categorical, criminalization of the child is not ownerless and it's not and also not owned by you right right, right. child has right. their own inherent right. dignity yeah wendy i'm sorry uh, paul and then paul had his hand up and then put it down paul and then wendy mm -hmm. elliot and then we, we do really want to do number 20 and then i also have a couple of hands up in this uh okay go ahead one of the things that i have struggled with as a parent is the idea that when and how to let my kids into a difficult secret of the universe, which is outcomes are uncertain. No matter how hard you try, no matter how holy you might be or aspire to bad things happen uh, very quickly or at some point. And is it kind to let your kids know that? Is it unkind to let your kids know that? And if so, what? Yeah. And in reading this, one of the things that I'm comfortable with is this idea of the image of God, which is a weird phrase to me. Because if God is infinite, the image is infinite. And so what is it that we're actually referring to? And just to bring the whole idea together, it's really all outcomes. You know, we're teaching them that all outcomes are possible. The best thing we can do is move the odds a little bit in your favor by behaving. The way that I relate to what you're saying is you can't ultimately protect your children. You can do your best to the Shmorotan to tend them and protect them, but you can't ultimately protect them from harm. Which is another way of saying outcomes are unpredictable. Like no matter like you can do everything you can and yet we feel that it's important to let them know that that's part of our job responsibility to let them know that, but then yeah. I think that's part of, of what a Shmira looks like. It's true that you can't ultimately protect your children in the sense that you're not all powerful. And certainly things can happen that are beyond your control. 
but what we what we can control we have a responsibility to control and so letting your children know too soon right is and that's uh, what you're saying is it's it's a very complicated that piece of shmira is very nuanced and very complicated like how you know how do we introduce things to children or how do we expose them to some of life as an important part of their own growth actually part of what it is to be a parent is to actually allow your child if you overprotect your child, then actually they don't grow into their own protector and they don't grow in the, and you're actually inhibiting their growth. So ironically, over Shmira can also inhibit, right? And over Shmira becomes an example of lack of Shmira. It's also the question of preciousness. Right. They're so precious that you step in at every moment to protect or overprotect. Right. And also I think the question of when is, that's a question for every stage of childhood. Like, you know, I have a child in college now, and I'm like, you know, helping her with her, you know, essays and papers, like how much should I help is a question I ask myself all the time. I don't think it's a question, that, you know, that is for one specific stage or age. It's like always, always, do you let them fall when they're learning how to walk? Do you let them write their own paper and how much so? And so the connection to what we're, I'm not buying the concept that personally, the is a problem, just as is the idea of Right. So, but I, I, I take it. I take issue with that. I think that um, holiness must have both sides of this coin, or else we run the risk, as we as we did for for thousands of years, of assuming that holiness kicks in at a certain point and has certain features, um, and we confuse extrinsic with intrinsic. And for for example, does. If you were a medieval philosopher who believed that rationality was the essence of the image of God, and that God, what it made, what it meant to be made in God's image was that you had, just as God is a rational actor, which is extant in Christian and Jewish and Muslim sources around the Middle Ages, because the, pri the primacy of rationality in Aristotelian philosophy had already made its way into Judaism. So if you believed that rationality was the definitional status of image of God, we have just as God is rational, so are we. You will then relegate to those who are not rational or not yet rational, pre-rational as children, let's say, or those who don't have the capacity for rational or rationality as less than someone who is rational. And you will wind up being caught in definitions of the holy that are not intrinsic. And so we must affirm that to be made in the image of God means that there is an intrinsic holiness that adheres and inheres in everything that is created with consciousness. And that there are some things for their extrinsic qualities that can then be evaluated, right? So every human being is holy, but if I had to choose, God forbid, between someone who could save a million lives and someone who wouldn't, and I had only one meal to give them, then I would evaluate it based on some extrinsic quality, because intrinsically there would be, there would be no difference. And so if we don't have both of those dimensions and both of those realities, then we wind up, wind up risking it, it can be quite regressive, right? You know, what about a, with someone who's born with, with full, you know, if you say the body is what makes you in the image of God, because God, right, is a full body, as the Bible seems to indicate, like to not to have a, a leg or a limb, you know, that is missing. Do you then say that those who are born without limbs are less holy? So you have to have some measure by which you affirm intrinsic givenness. And then also have another category, which is also outputs or extrin extrinsic holiness, I think. I don't know if you agree with that. I do. Okay. <laughs> All right. So I think you know it's nine forty-five. I really want. To yeah, to I really want to get to two more. So we're going to go till ten, but I wanted to get to source number number twenty on on the page. Amar of Chista. This is a great source for the holiness code of children. Amar of Chista leolam al yatil adam ema yiterab betoch beito. A person should never impose excessive fear upon the members of their household. So I read that as like. Don't run an abusive household. <laughs> it's right? like, like simple. Yeah. Don't be scary. Yeah. And, and you're scary. Parents can be super scary. Yeah. And, and teachers can be super scary. Right. And we don't realize that we can be super scary because we don't. And it's hard to understand the mammoth effect of your children. It's, it's too overwhelming. Like, how do you act in the face of that? Of their, of their vulnerability, because yeah. it's hard to be that child. Yeah. Oy. Amar, Amar of, you know, Amar of, Amar of, skip a couple lines, Kolam etil ema yitirav etoch beito, sofu ba lidei shalosh averot, 
said, if you're a scary person, in the end you'll come to these three graver sins, right? Like the three worst sins, right? Chilo Shabbat, Shvichud Damim, all of these things. Horrible things. Like, don't be so scary. And then, right, so essentially he's a model of not being scary. It's like, it's like a basic minimum. Don't be scary in your house. And this last source that I wanted to share, and then we'll open it up, is from maybe the greatest, maybe the one who did the most in Jewish literature for an early notion of a holiness code for children um, is the Piazetzna Rebbe, the Rebbe of the Warsaw Ghetto, Alava Shalom, the great, um, the great Columbus Kalman Shapira of, of, of Warsaw and of, of uh, Piazetzna, who wrote, who was called the Rebbe of the children, the, the, the Rebbe of, of all children, and also wrote a book called Chavat Talmidim, Many of his books were written with students in mind and how to, how to be with children. He was famous for having literally thousands of children um, in the court and, and had a mammoth impact. So I just wanted to read from the introduction to this, um, to his famous work, Chovat Talmidim, A Student's Obligation. Siach ima melamdim ve'avota banim. He writes, I want to start off this book by having a conversation with teachers and with parents. Shlomo Melech Amar, King, King Solomon wrote in Proverbs, He says, teach the lad according to the, teach children according to their way, their path, and when they're older, they will not turn away from it. He says, this is the essence of all education. It's not just when the child is a child. The Yad Aviv Odet Kifalav, Odat Kifalav, Yishmalav, Yaseki Mitzvotav, that when the parents are there telling you to brush your teeth or to, you know, to clean yourself up or whatever it is, that, that that's not the point of education, right? As long as that, you're still in your parents' home. Rak Gam Kishi Bushusav, that when the child will, will, will grow up and be in, in their own, on their own, they have their own power. Right, even when they get older, they, they have internalized the principles. That education, real education, by the way, parents are educators, right? The, the, the prime educators. I, you know, it's so amazing. I was, I was at Orzi, I said last night in my sermon, I was at my son Orzi's school, it's his sixth birthday today. And I was at his school yesterday for his birthday party. And I watched the teachers interacting with the children. I said, it, that would be the best course in parenting you could get is to watch really good teachers interacting with children at every level mm. like the best teachers mm. watch them right those are the ones that, that can teach you about how to run your household mm. right or to, or to like you know or to run your organization probably like like they know how to motivate they know how to make boundaries the really good ones right the really bad ones not you know so gam lo hergel bilvad it says that the, the pedagogy or, or education is not commandment. That it, do this and do that. That's not what true chinuch is. That's what it's gam loher Not just because you've habituated them to this. Like you keep giving them right habitual things that are big, bigger and bigger things to do. Right, right, and. And, and these two things, right, like commanding them or habit are simply tools. They're just tools, he says, that we use. Those are just tools in your toolkit. You use habit, or sometimes you need to use a, a, a bit of power. But the word chinuch itself tells us, he said, chinuch is, not, is um, to understand what pedagogy is, is chinuch means that you are, <clears throat> that you are bringing out which is that which is latent in the child. I'm not going to go through the whole thing here. He, he brings proofs for this, right? But it's basically chinuch, the word chinuch in Hebrew, which is education, means that you unpack that which is already latent in, that which is already there. Like when you remove a sword from its scab, like, you know, its scabbard, it's essentially you have taken out that which has already been there. To give another example, a seed. Everything's in the seed, right? Right, but you need to water it so that it emerges and unfolds and unpacks. Exactly. And so, so you're this not trying to bring something out of the seed that's not already in there. Exactly. And so here in, in number five here, when you use this 
unpacking the seed when it comes to children. He says that what it means, you look at number five here, I know it's hard because it's, the English is not exactly lined up with the Hebrew, it means that as it relates to a child is that the intention is to grow and to open up the nature of the child and the unique hachshara, the, the, the koach, the strength of that child, that is already in them in some latent way, in a small seed that is hidden but needs to be revealed. And kevan sha'isha Israeli odri yaldusa, because a child, he uses a Jewish child, but we'll say all children, odri yalduto, in their childhood, they already have the soul of God in them in a hidden way. We, we are there to, to help make sure that it emerges out of this, right, out of this world, out of their world, out from within them. Right, into, in order to make it blossom and bloom. That they become the person that they're meant to become, right? Right, and from there, Right, that's the way he says, he goes on to say so many very beautiful things, right, that, that each child has their own, that's why it says in Proverbs, right, teach the child according to who they are, because each person has their own way, their own path, their own soul. And so that a, a, a holiness code would also take this as a principle, that each child is a, a fractal of the divine, is unique, mm -hmm. and the job of parents mm -hmm. is both to protect the preciousness and the already holy of who they are, mm. and to not and recognize that they're not half care, they're not right, you know, not use fear, but to be invested in getting to know the uniqueness of the child and allow like your job is to help them become who they are always meant to be, so that when they leave your home, they have now right can mm, feel as that's if that's so beautiful. And it feels like a defining of what of Shema is, right? Like tending to it and guarding it is like developing it so it becomes itself, which is the opposite of abuse, which is insisting that you become someone you're not, or that you, you act according to my vision of who you are, mm -hmm. as opposed to unfolding, you know, in the ways that you are already. You know, in, in, in Alice Miller's seminal work, the drama of They Give the Child, and then again, when she wrote, Thou shalt not be aware, or for your own good, especially in for your own good, she, she explores the pedagogy of, of pre-Nazi Germany and Europe and so on for a thousand years, like what it was in terms of rearing children. And one of the fundamental principles was that children are born, right, they are born in, in, certainly in Christianity, certainly that was the case, that their resistance as a two-year-old, for example, in their, in, in their, no, their stage of oppositional bonding, that somehow the devil is in them and that children have to be have to be, Has to be beaten out of beaten them. Out of them. Right. And that's where we have to control them. Like, like they're, breaking they're, their horse. They're little animals, exactly. They're little animals, they're right. horses. They need to be, and the P.A. Zetzner says, are you, like he comes and he writes a book for parents and teachers okay. in, the, in the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, he writes and he says, no, 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 no. From the beginning, a child is holy, intrinsically holy. The child's curiosity, the child is energetic, the child brings joy, joy you know, that's a child. They're not unruly beasts. We're born with a neshama, with a soul. And so your job, parent, is not to beat it out of the child, but to, to honor it and to find it and to locate it and fan the flames of it and use love and use, like, he was, and he says, actually, in, in one of his, in, in, in this, later on in this work, he says, and if you're, a parent, if you're a teacher who can't see that, then you should find another line of work. <laughs> it's what he says. Have he says you're a parent that, who can't see that? <laughs> Well, then, then, then it's a problem, and not only is it a problem, it, it's a problem as it's a problem as pervasive as 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 poverty. It's a it's the problem that's as pervasive as as illiteracy. Like if we in this country spent as much money trying to raise up literacy around how to treat our children as we do to try to teach them how to read. If you ask your average person, would you rather be able to read a book? Or make sure that you live in a world where your parents don't use force to beat you to go to bed. Like there are so many like levels at which, again, it's like once a year we talk about this and we talk about it honestly. During the pandemic, the, 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 the number of domestic abuse cases and violence in the home skyrocketed. And it's clear that there's a connection between stress, obviously we all know this, and our ability to be patient with our children. But there's also 
One of the ways, of course, is to reduce stress in the pandemic, there's, right? But there's another way, which is to have an all-out term of assault here, but I don't mean it, but like an all-out campaign in synagogues, churches, mosques, everywhere about the dangers of using force with our children. And it has to be, you get to a point where we say that cultural difference and distinctions are not okay. It is not okay for someone to say that in my community growing up, I'm okay because my mama used a, a belt and I'm okay and I turned out okay. That is not, we must act for children and make these things, we must criminalize them. Now, whether or not the people are, you know, we don't want children taken away from their parents, that's certainly the case. And if God forbid somebody, you know, slaps a child, doesn't mean that they're a criminal or that they're a, a, a monster, God forbid. There are, in all things, intention is matters and, and context matters. But like to the extent that we don't use extreme language when it comes to this this pandemic, um, it, it's it's something that I think is it, itself is worthy of inter investigation. Like you know, like last night we had this woman in Balcoin was talking and she said she used an example of of if a father slaps a three year old child uh, because they walked across the street and they didn't wait for them, um, is that child abuse? And she used it to exa and examined it in contrast to another example where where a father was using a whip on, on children, on all five of his children, and doing it repeatedly, right? And clearly, what she was pointing out, and we had a conversation about this, is that there's frequency, and there's intensity, and then there's context. These three elements within child abuse are, are vital. But, but and, right, how do we create a holiness code which says that there is a right way to treat a child, and not, it's not up to each family to decide, Right. And I know that gets dangerous, too, because, you know, who decides and so on. But I think we should probably look at the evidence and see what are the methods that, you know, if the PSS's methods are borne out by science empirically, that children who grow up in homes without excessive force have greater self-esteem demonstrably, that they become more loving and, they, you know, the quality of life and, let, you know, fewer incidents of depression and suicidality, then I think we can probably, like, advocate that this should be the law of the land or at least the internal law of the land, not just on the books, but, okay, so we have uh, we have no time, so that means we should go with, we'll take one one comment from the uh, from the Zoom Magog, and then, uh, uh, you know, maybe we should just call it, we should just, yeah.